Good afternoon or good morning or good evening, depending on where you are, and welcome to our webinar today on how to design for high-density wireless LANs. We're going to be talking about some of the issues that we face with high-density design and how to resolve some of those issues, some of the things that we can do in order to implement a wireless network in high-density scenarios. Now, this is going to be part of a series of design type webinars we'll be doing this summer and the reason in case you have not heard the news is that we will be coming out with a new version of the CWDP certification a little bit later on this year so this is getting the gears going getting us started in that direction and so forth my name is Tom Carpenter and I'm the CTO here at CWNP and heavily involved in determining the certification direction, the objectives for the certifications and the things we need to cover, don't need to cover, all of that within these various different certifications that we have. Now, first of all, if you're not familiar with CWMP, I wanna let you know just a little bit about what it is that we offer. CWMP offers career certifications in enterprise Wi-Fi technologies, and they range from very beginner level certifications, like the one that's not even listed here on my screen, the CWTS certification, all the way through to advanced networking experts, the CWNE. And so depending on what it is that you're focusing on as a career goal or simply as knowledge acquisition, you may determine to go part way into the certification track. You may desire to go all the way through it. I know right now there are dozens of people that are getting very close to the point where they're going to be applying for their CWNE based on communications with me over the last three months. But it all starts with the CWNA. And so the CWNA is this really solid foundation of knowledge related to Wi-Fi. In fact, someone who has their CWNA certification probably knows more than 90% of the other folks out there in relation to wireless networking in the network engineering world. And so CWNA itself provides valuable information. But then from there, you go on to professional level certifications that focus on three areas, security, design, and analysis or troubleshooting. And so depending on the kind of work you do, if you were only going to get one other certification, you could choose the one that best applies. But if you wanted to become a certified wireless networking expert, then you would need to pass all four certifications, CWNA, CWSP, CWDP, and CWAP, and then apply for the CWNE. The CWNE certification is not granted based on passing an exam in a testing center, but rather it is granted based on the fact that you have proven your experience in the field and you have passed the other four exams. So there's not an additional exam for CWNE. In addition, we require that our CWNEs have two other certifications that are not CWNP certifications in the networking industry. For example, they could be Aruba certifications, they could be Cisco certifications, and so on. So this gives you an idea of who we are and the knowledge that we provide and the skill sets that we provide. And these webinars are about a, giving you a little taste of the knowledge that we provide in our training classes that you can attend live. And it's also about helping you to keep up to speed with important issues related to wireless networking. Well, we'll come back to some more important information about CWNP when we get to the end of the presentation. But for now, let's go ahead and move on and look at what we'll be covering today. So as we talk about high density, the first thing we want to do is really define what it is. You know, everybody says, well, there's high density. And now people say there's even VHD, very high density. And I guess that was a borrowing from 802.11 when we had HT or high throughput. And then we got VHT, very high throughput. Well, very high density is usually applicable to things like stadiums where within, say, a 100 square foot area, you might have 10 or 11 people and they may have three devices each or two devices each, what have you. And so very high density is that, but also preparing for the future. So some of you may have read some of the books written in the 90s by Kurtzwell and, and books since then. And if you read his book in 1998, I want to say it was that it came out, it might have been 1999, um, The Age of Spiritual Machines, then you'll know that he made some predictions about what would 
happen, what the world would look like by 2009, and then other predictions by 2019. Well, it's shocking how accurate his predictions were for 2009, and it really looks like he's going to be very accurate in his predictions for 2019. Now, he didn't use the phrase, but all the buzz today now seems to be this concept of IoT, Internet of Things. And this Internet of Things really actually just defines what he wrote in his book about 16 or so years ago now. And it looks like it's coming to pass in the time frame that he said, where that, you know, not only is your toaster going to be on the Internet, but the toast that pops out of the toaster probably will be too. Okay, that might be a bit of an exaggeration. But there are a lot of things connecting to our networks. And this is going to drive high density in areas where today it may not necessarily be. So we have to understand how to design wireless networks that can handle lots of devices for each user in a given space. So we'll define it and then we'll talk about the problems. What are the problems then? So once we know what high density is, well, what's the big deal? Why not just design a wireless network and let it do its job and everything will be just fine? Well, there are challenges because of the way Wi-Fi works, the way wireless works in general or radio frequency based communications that cause us to have to step back and analyze those problems so that we can come up with the proper solutions. And then that'll, of course, be the last set of topics. We'll look at some different solutions, some different things that we do in order to actually implement high density. Now, before we go beyond the agenda and get into d definition of high density, let me just say that this presentation is being recorded and it will be made available on the CWNP TV YouTube channel after the presentation is complete. So you can certainly view that presentation later on. And also, if you didn't notice, uh, it's important to know that now with our webinars, we're doing two every time. And so we have one at one o'clock Eastern time and one at 9 p.m. Eastern time. So that helps those that are from different places around the world. So if you didn't catch that and right now you've stayed up late in order to be able to watch this webinar, well, I've got good news for you. You may not have to next time. So this is the first time we've done it and we'll be doing that going forward as well. As I'm talking through the information today, if you have any questions, please use the chat mechanism. So if you click on chat in your WebEx interface, use the chat mechanism and just go ahead and send the questions to all participants so that we can all see the question. And then I will answer the question verbally if it's a technical question. There are others on with me that may be able to answer your question in the chat as well. So they may answer it in text. But if it's a question that's technical or related to what we're talking about, I'll do my best to take care of that question just as we're flowing along. So again, please use the chat, not the Q&A, and go ahead and just type your question into all participants in that chat area. So with that, let's go ahead and define high density. So high density, how do we define it here at CWNP? Well, you know, we're vendor neutral, so we do not necessarily say high density is implementing a certain number of a specific vendor's AP, right? Instead, here's the definition we have. High density is a reference to the number of clients requiring connectivity and capacity in a given physical space. In other words, you have high density at some threshold of clients in a physical space that require connectivity and capacity. Now, what that threshold is can vary, but the point is high density is linked to really two factors, the number of clients, but then also the capacity demands of those clients. And so these are factors. So uh, connectivity is linked to SNR, signal to noise ratio, right? So in other words, we get a higher data rate when we have better SNR. And so the connectivity is linked to SNR. Capacity is linked to just the total air time. You know, there's only so much time and waves take time to travel. So there's only so much time and therefore the data rate as well. So the data rate I'm communicating at and the constraint of air time, there is only so much of that. And that defines for me my capacity in a given channel. Now, both of these have to be accomplished. We have to have connectivity. We have to have capacity. In other words, we can't just say, well, hey, I bought an AP that supports 250 connected users. Therefore, I have implemented that one AP and I now have high density. Well, that's not really the way we want to define high density. We want to make sure that high density is provisioned according to the needs of the implementation and not just that we threw a bunch of APs at it. 
So 10 clients at a 300 square foot space is probably not high density, right? You know, you've got a, a say 30 by 10 room and you've got 10 clients in there and even one AP. Well, we wouldn't call that high density, but 50 clients in the same space probably is for most people. But it's important to know that everyone defines the actual threshold differently. And many just avoid defining the threshold and they just say high density is a lot of clients requiring connectivity and capacity in a given physical space. But again, then we have very high density, which is even more clients requiring connectivity and capacity at a given physical space. So how you decide to ultimately say what your threshold is for high density is going to be something you'll have to determine. But whatever that threshold is, whatever you're calling high density, it's important to know that there are some shared problems that we're all going to face. So what are the problems of high density? Well, first of all, RF signals don't stop. Now, what do I mean by that? RF signals don't stop. Well, that's a simple West Virginia way of saying that RF signals go further than we often think they do. And because of that, we can really face some challenges in high density when we want many APs in a space, particularly in 2.4 gigahertz. And we'll talk more about that later, but it's particularly problematic in the 2.4 gigahertz space because we only have really in most parts of the world, three channels to work with. So the issue then is that since they don't stop, we have to find a way to weaken them right? We want to make them so that they are attenuated at a given point such that they are no longer going to interfere with the same channel being used at that given point. And so it's about management of power, right? And we'll talk more about that later. The second thing is default settings don't work. Uh, what do I mean by that? Default settings. Well, a lot of APs come with the default setting of the highest output power. That's not going to work. Um, many APs may come with 80 megahertz channels. Uh, for example, Cisco sells an access point, the, the WAP371, which is a good access point for a small business or something like that. And that's what it's sold to is the small and medium market, but mostly small business market. Well, that access point comes with a default configuration. If you just enable the radio and leave it at the default of an 80 megahertz channel in five gigahertz and a 20 megahertz channel in 2.4 gigahertz. Well, you may not want to use, well, let's not say may, you don't want to use that 80 megahertz channel in five gigahertz if you're really after high density. You need to use the narrower channels of 40, probably 20 in order to implement high density. So the default settings are not going to work and we're gonna to have to change those. The bandwidth is limited. So we only have so much frequency space, right? Again, in 2.4 gigahertz, you can generally say you've got three channels. In five gigahertz, you've got 20 plus channels, but many of them may not be available for various constraints. And we'll talk about that. And also more devices are coming. You know, we've got the watches now as well as the phone and the tablet and the laptop. So, you know, we're up to four for many people. For some people, we're up to five. And who knows what the future holds when we get to the point where uh, all kinds of devices, like maybe even hearing aids, for example, connect to Wi-Fi for various reasons. And so we could eventually get to the point where we could see that an average user has five, six, seven devices pretty quickly here. And that means a lot more devices communicating. Now, in fairness, many of those devices communicate with very little data. So they don't send a massive amount of data. They don't receive a massive amount of data, but they are still there. And it's an important consideration. So what do we do? We can just stop the madness, right? Shut off Wi-Fi. <laughs> well, that's probably not the solution. So instead, we need to design for high density. Now. Let me address a common misconception. A common misconception is that to do high density, you just add more APs. That's all you have to do, right? That fixes everything. Well, it doesn't necessarily fix everything. Um, the reality is that you probably will add more APs, but it's not just about adding the APs. It's about adding the APs properly located and properly configured in order to successfully achieve high density. So this is an important thing to consider. Now, let me pause right here and I'll talk more about this in a moment. I have a question here. If you need to do a site survey for one install, is it possible to rent a spectrum analyzer? Um, you know, you might find a source to rent a spectrum analyzer for you, but uh, it's 
it's a bit of a challenge in order to find that. It depends on the size. If this is a large network, even for just one install, it may be very well worth the cost of buying a spectrum analyzer. For example, going the MetaGeek route, you can get a spectrum analyzer for around $1,200. So if this is just one install you're going to do, you're never going to do another, you're just doing it in your company, and it's large enough to justify that, then that might be a way to go. If it's not large enough to justify that, then maybe you can get by in a small install with not even using a spectrum analyzer per se. That is to say, you can implement some uh, APs and using protocol analyzers, you can locate areas where there may be interference that is not Wi-Fi simply because of the retries, but that's only if it's a really clean space. So in a really clean space, you can use a protocol analyzer on a computer monitoring communications with an AP and you see a lot of retries when there aren't other Wi-Fi networks around, then that could tell you, okay, there may be something else in that frequency space. So there are some ways you can get around it, but obviously if you really want to do it right, you want the right tools and you'll want to get a spectrum analyzer to accomplish that, okay? All right, so adding more APs is just not sufficient for high density deployments because it's about having enough APs, but it's also about having APs on the right frequency band. And it may be a decision of, do you want all of your APs to be dual band? Do you want just some of them to be? Do you want to go with APs that are software configurable so that if there are two radios, both of them can be in five gigahertz on a given AP and etc. So there are a lot of different decisions about APs that you need to make in a high density environment. It's definitely more than just saying, hey, let's go ahead and put 30 APs in that big conference room that can seat 1,500 people and everything's going to be okay. The decisions are more complex than that. So to understand the decisions, we need to begin talking about solutions. So the solutions to high density. First of all, we want to take advantage of 5 gigahertz in every possible way. Now what that means is we're going to, where we can influence clients, try to have more 5 gigahertz clients. It means we're going to direct clients to 5 gigahertz as much as possible. And we'll talk about band steering a little bit later that can help us with that. And so we want to use 5 gigahertz as much as we can. If you use a spectrum analyzer that we just talked about, in just about any space today, you'll see that 5 gigahertz is pretty clean. A lot of people have implemented dual radio APs and dual band APs, but what you find is because so many of the clients are still 2.4 gigahertz that the utilization in the 5 gigahertz space is not as high for many deployments. So we're really trying to move that direction. We already have many more channels in 5 gigahertz and we hope to have even more in the coming years. Of course, that'll take some time to work into the support of the chipsets and the standards and all of that, but it's something that we have hopes for here in the coming decade. The second solution is to create smaller cells. Now, what this means is basically we're reducing the output power of the APs. So yes, it's a different way of thinking than we had 10, 11, 12 years ago when we said, man, I wish I had a super high gain antenna and I could have an AP with 300 milliwatts of output power because I want a big cell. And that was because you had, you know, three people in a warehouse that needed access. We're not thinking like that these days. So instead, we want to create smaller cells. And this is usually even true in non-high density deployments. So even in deployments that we're not calling high density, we tend to not want some max output power AP, but rather something that's 100 or lower milliwatts of output power for those indoor deployments because we need capacity. So even if there are only 15 people connected to APs, we to each AP, we still need them to have the capacity they need. And that drives us to implementing, in many cases, more APs with smaller cell sizes, even if we wouldn't technically call it a high density deployment. The other solution is to create directional cells. And this means that we're using either an AP that is pre-built for it, which is less common, or we're using an AP with external antennas. And those antennas allow us to really give focus or direction to the RF signal so that we're creating these directional cells. Now, an important thing to keep in mind when building directional cells, and I won't talk about it a lot today because it's really a complex topic and uh, time would fail us to get into the details of it. But when you're creating directional cells, you always have to remember that the clients are not directional. 
Okay, let me say that again. When you're creating directional cells, the clients are not directional. So you still have to think about channel separation even with directional cells, because if it's a laptop or a tablet or a, a mobile phone that is connecting to that AP with say a semi-directional antenna, then you have to understand that that tablet, laptop, phone, that signal is going out omnidirectional around that device, which means you've got to think about the different areas that that device could communicate with. So you kind of have to think, okay, what devices in the path of this directional cell would be able to connect at the data rate that I'm requiring, because maybe you turn off some low data rates, at the data rate that I'm requiring they could connect and communicate with this AP, where would their signal cause co-channel interference? Where would their signal cause co-channel contention, if you prefer that terminology? So this is something that you have to think about in high density deployments with directional cells. It's not as simple as saying, well, the AP only talks in one direction, that's all we care about, because the clients talk too. Now, the other thing is we can take advantage of attenuating materials. In other words, sometimes you can, uh, to reduce the cell size even smaller, because with many APs, even with the lowest output power, it's still going to create a fairly good size cell. But if you mount the AP in the floor under seats or uh, in the, the ceiling with materials around it that attenuate the signal in some way, so in other words, you intentionally put it on the other side of some attenuating barrier, then it can help to reduce the distance the signal travels in that free space. So it's just strategically taking advantage of the facility, whereas normally we'd be frustrated by it and, and annoyed by the fact that those signals are being attenuated. Now all of a sudden we think, hmm, that's nice. The signal is being attenuated. What do you know? There is a scenario where we love the fact that a building is built with a bunch of block walls. <laughs> so these are some things that you could take advantage of as well. Uh, but it's also important to remember, you have to ensure the wired side is sufficiently provisioned. So a big thing to think about here is, yes, we're building high density. We're making sure Wi-Fi can handle it. But what we don't want is to connect 20 APs into a switch that are 802.11 AC APs, and then that switch has only a one gigahertz, uh, one gigahertz uh, back uplink or something. So we have to be careful with that. Uh, creating a, aren't you creating a playground for hidden nodes? I'm thinking this playground for hidden nodes it may be talking about the directional cells. Um, or it may be talking about the attenuating materials. I'm not sure. But that is something that you do have to consider, Dane, when you're building uh, any type of high-density deployment. Uh, you, With these different strategies that can be used, you always have to think about the intentional or accidental creation of hidden nodes um, and the problems that that could cause. So you're right. That is something to consider. Uh, so we've got to make sure we get the bandwidth on the wired side because getting the wireless side up is just not worth it alone. Uh, I just uh, did a, a bit of work in a deployment recently for a campground uh, where people go um, several times throughout the summer um, for a big meeting type of campground where there's like 900 people in the facility at a given time. And so they came to me and they said, we want the Wi-Fi in here to work so that when 900 people are here, if they all want to get on with their cell phone, they can. And um, I said, okay, that, that's fine. But what do you want them on for? Well, so if they want to get on the internet. And I said, okay, that's good. Did you know you have a seven megabit internet connection? And they said, well, yeah, what's the problem? <laughs> well, the problem is who cares about high density when you're trying to give 900 people internet access with seven megabits. Thankfully, I was able to talk them up to 50 megabits per second at least. Um, still not probably sufficient for what they're trying to accomplish, but at least people will be able to, I don't know, check their email within an hour of delay. So the point is that you've got to think about the wired side. It's not just about Wi-Fi. Let's just say it clearly, Wi-Fi people. Wi-Fi is not always the problem. Okay. Now, the next thing is you want to make sure you implement scalable security solutions. And what I'm talking about here is many times high density deployments are in stadiums and conference centers and things like that. And you've got a captive portal that you're implementing in order to decide who can access the network. So you want to make sure that that thing is scalable, that it can handle the load that you're going to put on it and that it can grow if need be in the future. So these are solutions. Let's talk about a little bit more uh, of some of these. Uh, so first of all, I said you want to use five gigahertz as much as possible and in every way possible. Well, what we're dealing with here is just the fact that we have more channels. So when you take a look here at the diagram, uh, you can see that we have 
uh, eight channels on the low end, Uni 1, Uni 2, and then we have five channels on the high end, Uni 3, and that's good. We have these channels, but you may not always be able to use all of the channels. It is common to see client devices that support either eight or 12 five gigahertz channels. And it's not at all uncommon to see that all of these channels in Uni2 Extended are not supported. And then there are regulatory factors at different parts of the world that I don't even really want to get into today. We've got terminal Doppler weather radar that's indicated here in yellow. So there are different factors that impact whether some of these channels will be available or not. And many devices only support Uni1 and Uni3 or Uni1 and part of Uni2 and Uni3 or all of Uni1, Uni2 and Uni3. So it's important to know what your devices are going to actually support that you're uh, expecting to be in the space. So for example, you might say, well, wait a minute, it's out of my control, it's a stadium. Well, it's not really. We can look and see the percentage of people that are on an iPhone 5 versus an iPhone 6, uh, the percentage of people that are on Android devices and what are the most popular devices. And so we can make some intelligent predictions about the kind of clients that are even going to be there in a public space. But certainly, uh, if you already have have a network that's not handling it well, you can see the devices that are connecting to that network. So there are ways that we can get that information and estimate it and use that in our planning for our channel plans. But clearly the point is we have more five gigahertz channels. At the same time though, while the newer standard 802.11ac supports up to 160 megahertz channel, uh, megahertz channel as the new chips are coming out and so on, and new devices supporting those chips, well, that's true, but we probably don't want to use that in a high density deployment. It's, it's simply not an efficient use of our channels, and we don't even want to use 80 megahertz in high density. You might find a scenario that you would call high density that you'd want to use 40 megahertz in, but quite a lot of the high density, certainly very high density, use 20 megahertz channels still, because your goal is to get the best throughput for as many people as possible, and 20 megahertz channels are going to help you do that. 40 megahertz channels are going to get you more throughput, but for fewer people, because you have fewer APs available in a given space to support those people. So that's always something that we have to keep in mind. And ultimately, uh, the reason we're constrained is because of channel reuse, right? So in 2.4 gigahertz, you have three channels, 1, 6, and 11. Generally speaking, there can be some other configurations, but that's basically what we have. And so you have to stagger those and make sure they're not stepping on each other. So you have to make sure that one channel, one AP is not causing so much co-channel contention for another AP that they just can't function. And so there has to be enough physical separation. That's one way to think of it, but really it's about RF power level separation. In other words, we need the RF signal to have attenuated, weakened, lost its strength enough so that it doesn't cause adverse co-channel contention or co-channel interference. And this is true in 5 gigahertz too, that we are going to do channel reuse, but the channels do not overlap as much. So we really have the channels. And so we can really use these different channels and we've got a lot more of them that we can build out with so that we're not stepping on each other as much. And it's also important as we're building our high density that we're remembering that it's not just about providing coverage. If it was just about providing coverage, then you could put in one or two very high gain APs and, and cover a huge part of a stadium. But obviously that doesn't work. So it's about capacity as well. And then the point is that even when we're designing microcell networks, the APs are too close together, you get co-channel interference, or as I said, co-channel contention. And this causes the overall performance of the APs to decline. So co-channel contention, in case you're with us and do not really know a lot about that, what it is, is a client cannot communicate if it sees another 802.11 device communicating on the channel. It really doesn't matter if it's on the same channel, uh, I should say, if it's in the same uh, BSS that it's in. It can be in a different BSS, but if it's on the same channel, it will not communicate. And we call that co-channel interference, but it's, it's technically co-channel contention because we're actually having to pause our communication until that uh, uh, other communication is done. And so this is where within the standard, they define power levels. And there's a, a uh, minimum power level that we will say is below the energy detect threshold. And as long as it's not there, we can communicate. And that's where this separation comes in in keeping our APs physically or 
RF power level enough apart so that they're not stepping on each other. Another factor to consider that you'll want to implement then is band steering. And so band steering is about driving people to five gigahertz as much as possible. When you do that, it can help alleviate the capacity constraints that are in 2.4 gigahertz. So this is one method, a basic concept. A client sends a 2.4 gigahertz probe request and the AP just doesn't respond. And then it sees a five gigahertz probe request from the same client with the MAC address. And then it gives a probe response to that. So that's one way that it can function as far as band steering. And there are different algorithms that different vendors use. Band steering is not really an 802.11 standard thing as much as just something that's implemented by vendors in order to help direct stations over to five gigahertz. And some stations are just really stubborn. They can have five gigahertz radios in them. And even with band steering enabled, they just keep pushing for 2.4. And the vendors have a a time within which they'll go ahead and honor that 2.4 gigahertz request and let them on. So this is an important thing to know, but it will uh, help move some to five gigahertz that might not be there otherwise. You can also, if they're your computers that you're deploying, you can often set preference settings. So you can give preference to five gigahertz whenever it's available. That can help as well. But again, in public deployments, you can't always control those kinds of settings. Another thing to think about is channel bonding. And I've already alluded to this, so this is all just about illustrating the concept and making sure you understand it. Um, 40 megahertz channels, all right? This is what we're talking about here because 40 megahertz is the most you would want to use in high density. A 40 megahertz channel in 2.4 gigahertz, as you can see in the bottom half of this diagram, causes significant overlap and problems. That is one 40 megahertz channel in 2.4 gigahertz pretty much takes up the entire space where that you can't effectively use another channel. Even another 20 megahertz channel would be problematic, but certainly a second 40 megahertz channel is not going to work. But in 5 gigahertz, you can do two 40 megahertz channels. You can do four 40 megahertz channels. You could do six 40 megahertz channels in just about all deployments. And so there are a lot of options that you have there if you wanted to do 40 megahertz. But again, in large scale high density, you're probably going to stay with 20 megahertz. And let me talk about that a little bit more from another perspective. And that is what 802.11 AC introduces, which is 80 and 160 megahertz channels. So here we're talking about even larger channels. Well, 80 megahertz channels could be useful in like a small business deployment that just needs four or five non-overlapping channels and they can use the DFS channels and things like that. Sure, it might be fine there. But in an, even an enterprise deployment, just a standard enterprise deployment, it's going to be challenging to implement 80 megahertz channels. Now, you may be aware that 802.11ac introduced a, a kind of channel stacking method that allows you to have two different 80 megahertz channels sharing some space, and then they only use the full space if the other uh, BSS is not communicating in that space. And I'm not going to get into the details of that. We'll be talking about that kind of thing in some other webinars at other times. But for now, just know that there's a technology there that's available to do that kind of channel overlap or channel stacking, but it's not efficient. It's just not as efficient in most cases. And so the more common use is probably going to be 40 megahertz channels in standard enterprise deployments. 160 megahertz channels, where are you going to use that? Well, you know, in your living room at home, maybe. And I, I know I seem like I'm saying that tongue in cheek, but right now with the frequency space we have, that's about the only place you're probably going to want to use 160 megahertz channel. And that can give you some really high throughput. So for the most part, with enterprise deployments, 40 megahertz, high density deployments, 20 megahertz, some high density 40, but certainly 20 for the large scale high density deployments. I just have one more uh, topic I want to address just briefly here, and that is that there's another factor that plays into your deployment in high density. And that is that uh, you can only provide so much capacity. You're constrained by the frequency space we have, the bandwidth that we have. So it's always a good idea to make sure you've implemented quality of service well. And so 802.11e originally introduced it, but it's just part of 802.11 2012, the, the standard that we have today. And... Um, it gives us mapping of wired quality of service to wireless quality of service. And it does that by creating what are called access categories. 
So we have a voice, video, best effort, and background access category. The ACVO is voice, ACVI is video, ACBE is best effort, and ACBK is background. Well, the point is that when there's a transmit opportunity, voice gets priority, then video would be next, then best effort, and then background. And sometimes when you look at these kind of diagrams, you think about it and you're thinking in the the speed at which it's explained. So in other words, I say, there's a transmit opportunity, there's something in the voice queue, well, it will go. If not, there's something in the video queue. We're thinking at explanation speed, but realize this happens massively faster than explanation speed. And so your background stuff's going to get through, it's just going to be the lowest priority to get through onto the network. But we wanna make sure that this is implemented properly, but more importantly, that quality of service is implemented end to end. and in the uh, CWDP training course and CWDP study guide, uh, that's something that we'll be focusing on and helping you understand how to implement quality of service from end to end and not just turn it on on your access points, but rather it's something that needs to be there throughout the network infrastructure in order to really get the benefit that it provides. Okay, so those are the topics that we had to cover today. And what I'd like to do then is pause at this point. We've talked a little bit about high density and give you time to think about some questions while I share some information with you. Uh, we do have coming up here in September on the 24th through the 26th in San Francisco this year, our uh, IT Professional Wi-Fi Trek Conference. It's the CWNP conference. There will be dozens of presentations there on security topics, design topics, uh, troubleshooting topics. Uh, we've got great presenters lined up to help you understand the current trends in Wi-Fi. So if you haven't registered yet and you want to attend, you want to make sure you go to cwnp.com slash 2015 National Conference for that. Also know that if you're getting ready for certifications, if you're interested in getting your CWMP certifications, Robert Bartz, who runs 802 Technology Solutions, one of our learning partners, will be offering CWDP and CWSP classes Monday through Wednesday, the week before that actual conference. So the Monday through Wednesday, he'll be there. The Thursday through Saturday, we'll be there. And so... He, you can take advantage of that. There'll be testing available at the end of the classes. And when you actually register for that class at a special pricing of only $26.95, you get attendance at the CWNP conference as well. And so for just slightly more than what that class normally costs, you actually get to also attend the conference. So it's a really great deal. And you can find out more about that by contacting Robert Bartz directly. His email address is here on the screen, robert at 802.com. So you can check that out with him. So with that information and our content shared, I'd just like to pause, give you a chance to chat in any questions in the chat box that you might have. So again, go to chat, not Q&A, go to chat, and in the chat area, go ahead and put in any questions that you might have, and we will address those. And while we're waiting on that, let me just uh, let you know what's coming up here. Uh, so within the next month or so, you're going to see the release of a new uh, CWDP study guide for the new version of the CWDP exam. The new exam will be available by the beginning of September and training classes will start running in August and September as well. Uh, there will be e-learning and practice exams available at our website all within the next uh, 30 to 40 days. So you'll want to watch out for that and uh, take a look at those and see uh, what kind of resources might be helpful to you there in your CWDP studies. Um, when will this recording be available? The recording will be available sometime within the next five business days. So it may take a little while just to get it uh, processed and uploaded, but sometime within the five uh, business days. What is the suggestion on the number of clients per five gigahertz radio? Well, you know, that's, a, that's an interesting question. It, it just depends on the, dance, the density. I was going to say your name, Dane, and I said the density. Uh, it's, it's going to depend on the density that you're actually deploying for. So uh, you may be in a situation where you've got only eight to 10 clients per radio, uh, and then other situations might have 15 to 20 clients per radio. So it really just depends on the density. Uh, look at your vendor literature, see what they suggest for that. Many vendors now actually have not only standard corporate um, deployment guidelines, 
but they give you high density deployment guidelines that they have tested thoroughly as well. So check with that and see what their recommendation is, certainly for the max, but in high density, you're never going for the max. Uh, the next question you have said about the direct signal, have you already used that technique with irradiation cable? If yes, can you explain the benefits and the problems that you have found? Um, I'm really not sure what what the question means. I'm not sure if you're talking about directional antennas um, and using irradiation cable instead of directional antennas, but I will tell you I have no personal experience with irradiation cable. So I have not myself worked with that, and there might be someone on the chat that is uh, experienced with it, and if you are, feel free to chime in for Andre and let him know your thoughts there. Uh, to my knowledge, is multi-user MIMO going to alter this? Well, you know, multi-user MIMO is, is yet to be deployed in any uh, practical way that we can look at it, learn from it, and see what it actually does and how it works for us. So uh, my statement to that would be, for now, I'm very reserved in thinking that in high-density deployments, it's going to provide a significant benefit uh, because we're already designing small cells with few fewer clients in those cells, uh, but we might find that there is an eventual point that we could use that. But like I said, I just hesitate to speak on something that I have not been able to test myself and work with. So it's something that hopefully I'll be getting my hands on gear that supports it, some clients that support it, and be able to analyze that in the last half of this year, first half of next year, and I'll have some better answers for you then. But for now, I think it's going to be a while before at least we see any significant benefit from it. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, okay. I understand, James, your questions about the dynamic frame width with 802.11ac. Uh, CCI, well, you know, I, the issue there is a little different. Um, I, I could, well, let me take that back. I guess from a client side in a different channel, you could see some CCI caused by it. I think the issue here is the fact that we have to RTS CTS on all of the 20 megahertz channels uh, in the channel bond in order to decide which of them we can use when doing this dynamic channel width. So I think because of that, we're, the issue's right there, even uh, disregarding CCI. So I think CCI is just going to be the same as it's always been. And that is that uh, we're stepping on each other with the different channels that are at a distant and not close to each other. Uh, CCI should not be directly related to the dynamic use of channel space by 802.11ac, but the, uh, the, the issue there with efficiency is going to be the RTS-CTS to find out which channels we can communicate on before we actually communicate, and so we're forcing ourselves to have to use RTS-CTS. So that would be my answer to that uh, in kind of a quick answer anyway. Let's see here. Talk about how two stream and three stream APs relate to high density deployments and client considerations. Well, that's a good question. Uh, you know, the reality is the vast majority of your clients are one or two stream. And so we don't have a lot of three stream clients in 802.11ac. Now with 11n, we've got quite a few uh, three stream clients that are out there. Um, how does it affect? Well, the point is your server, sorry, your AP will support the three streams, even uh, in uh, a 20 megahertz channel. So it'll support the three streams and you can use them for the clients that support it and not use it for the clients that don't. And so how does it relate to high density deployments? Well, you want a three by three by three AP in most cases on the AP side. And then it's really gonna be the clients that are going to determine where that gets utilized. In a modern high-density wireless LAN, when disabling slower speeds, what should you use as a cutoff data rate to block below? Well, that's a good question, Gavin, and it's tough to just answer in a blanket statement because there's another factor in this, okay? So we might say we're not going to support anything below 11 megabits per second, right? Well, if we say we're not going to support anything below 11 mega megabits per second, yes, that means a client that could only connect at 11 megabits per second would only be able to connect at that rate. But here's what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean the RF just stops at that client. I hope you get that. So, so what I mean is that the RF continues on even though that client cannot connect and the RF can still cause co-channel interference at another AP. 
What I'm trying to accomplish is keeping a low data rate client off the network so that it doesn't slow the network down with its actual communications, okay? So that's what the, the disabling of lower data rates would be. It is not a factor of cell size. The cell size factor is going all the way out to that detectable frame at a very low rate or that energy detect level, right? So it still goes out further than the data rate boundary. So there's a, there are two boundaries. There's the data rate boundary, and there's really what we could call the CCI or CCC boundary. And so both of those have to be considered when you're deploying it. You definitely have to still think about your co-channel interference, even when you remove those lower data rates. Um, Todd asks, is there a difference between how a spec analyzer sees channel utilization versus how an AP sees channel utilization? And can you explain it? If you have time, of course, the spec analyzers see raw energy, APCs, 802.11 traffic, but wouldn't the channel utilization be similar? Um, yeah, so the 802.11 AP sees the 802.11 traffic, and as far as its channel utilization goes, um, it's going to see the amount of time that the channel is busy communicating a frame. The difference with a spec in is it's going to be able to see non-Wi-Fi energy. So it will be able to also account for non-Wi-Fi energy that is consuming airtime. Uh, that could be some type of a Bluetooth device nearby or a microwave or just anything that's on 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz or whatever you're looking at. Uh, and by the way, 5 gigahertz is starting to see an awful lot of devices that are not Wi-Fi, just in case you haven't noticed that. Um, I had uh, purchased a wireless video um, uh, connection device, which uh, lets you connect one end to your projector, the other to your laptop, and it uses five gigahertz to send through an HDMI signal. Well, um, that thing completely saturates channel 165. I mean completely. It eats the whole channel up. There's nothing left. And that's not Wi-Fi at all. So the point is that you can see that kind of thing with the Spectrum Analyzer too. So that's where the benefit comes in. Are we getting away from 2.4 gigahertz because it's overcrowded? That's exactly the issue. There's so much going on in 2.4 gigahertz that we just can't find the free airtime there, okay? It's all about airtime. I've got to have airtime to communicate. So there's no, not enough free airtime to communicate because there's so many things wanting the airtime. Uh, think of it like you've got a one lane road that everybody needs to go on to get to work because it's the only bridge that goes across the river uh, to an island. Well, obviously that's a problem in comparison to having 50 lanes. So uh, in the same way, we've got a three lane road in 2.4 gigahertz and we've got a 20 plus lane road in five gigahertz. And so that's the big difference there. Uh, using materials such as floors, seats, walls as attenuation is used for good design. What is the impact of near field attenuation versus far field attenuation in a practical design aspect? When placing under a floor, do you place the AP one meter below the floor or directly next to it? Um, you know, so th that's really a constraint of the physical space you're in. You might place it farther below the floor if you can, but sometimes you literally have just a few inches in there to work with. And so it is gonna vary. Um, so we can talk about uh, technical factors and we'd have to get into some pretty complex explanations and concepts there, or we can just say that you're certainly going to be constrained by the space. And then when you have that space, you can work with it and find the best place to locate them. APs with external antennas connected to an attenuator will help in high density too. That's a good point. Um, so you can use an external antenna and you can intentionally weaken the signal, uh, attenuate the signal even further from the lowest setting of the AP. Okay, um, would it stop a client connecting from a distance? Yes, lowering the data rates uh, or removing low data rates would stop a client from connecting at a distance. But again, Gavin, the thing to remember is while it stops a client from connecting at the distance, it does not stop the devices from seeing that RF signal. And so um, it's still good. That's where co-channel interference could come in because energy detects sees that it's going on and says, well, I can't talk right now. And so we've got contention interference. And uh, so that's still going to be there. So we still have to be careful about the cell size. We again, remove low data rates to keep clients from connecting that would end up slowing down everybody's communications because they're connected. Okay.
All right. Well, uh, we've had some good questions, and I hope you've gotten some good information out of the webinar today. Um, do feel free to take advantage of our forums. If you go to cwnp.com, you'll find the link at the top to get to the forums. So if you have further questions, you can ask out there. We've got a nice community that really helps to support and get answers to your questions. But thank you very much for attending today. I hope your high-density deployments go well. Please remember our national conference coming up in September, and I hope you have a great weekend coming up. Thanks for attending, everyone. And this will end the webinar.